It used to be when I was sinning, Satan stood off somewhere grinning as the pleasures that they brought turned on me. Teardrops came like rain falling till I heard my Savior calling. If you can't go on anymore, just lean on me. I won't walk without Jesus. I will talk without Jesus. I refuse to live one day as before. I won't go without Jesus. It just ain't so. Without Jesus, everything that I I just won't do without the Lord. A beggar was lame by the gate. He was sitting all his life. He'd been regretting because he'd never stood or even strolled on down the street. Then Peter and John happened by his way. Look up on us. Peter did say, rise up and walk in the name of the Lord and leave to speak. He said, I won't walk without Jesus. I won't talk without Jesus. I refuse to live one day as before. Jesus, I refuse to live one day as before. I won't go without Jesus, it just ain't so. Without Jesus, everything that I would do, I just won't do without the Lord. one of you for your songs tonight. Appreciate them. May the Lord bless you. And it's good to have our Canadian brothers and sisters with us. Thank you for being here. So God bless you. Turn the service to Brother Jackson this time. I want to explain a few things here about the chart to have in your mind, brothers and sisters, before we go any further. <clears throat> Actually, this, this line here from the top side represents the first 15 days of that <coughs> month that the Passover is to occur in. And I've got all kinds of writings there that's been taught down through the centuries of time. And these writings did not occur from a bunch of backwoods people somewhere. They, they occurred from educated, many times historians, indulging in the things <clears throat> that relates to time, months, and so forth. But it is a sad thing to think that people within this dispensation of grace when God has been in the process of redeeming out of us Gentiles, a people, to make up the beginning of a new family altogether, it goes to show that the devil has done his best to try to disrupt us and get us divided. Well, look at the church world. It is divided. And God is not the author of it. 
They all claim they believe the word. But when you trace it down, there's certain things in it they believe. The rest they treat it as irrelevant. Well, the whole chronology of God's word was not written for it to be treated that way. And I want to say, I have here in my possession, they've had Christ crucified April the 1st, 30 A.D. Others, April the 1st, 31 A.D. But I've got the latest. He was crucified April the 3rd, 33 A.D. And that's backed up also by a Jewish history. That states that Jesus, they believed, was an insurrectionist. That he was crucified in the year 33 CE. That's the common era. So now, brothers and sisters, the time comes in the mind of real true believers. You have to get your mind to the place you have confidence in something. And anything that I might say about Advent belief or anything like that, please, I do not do that to belittle anybody. I thank God. He brought me out of a Methodist church. They don't even believe in a millennium earthly reign at all. They have taught all through their time, brother and sister, that the earth is going to burn up one of these days and the, bright, uh, the, the righteous saints are going to be taken to heaven and thereby we live forever. They end it all right there. Well, anybody that knows the, stru the structure of the scriptures, that's not true. But nevertheless, systems has existed on the fringes of things like this. And the time comes, and I can see, God has waited till right here at the end time, when he has definitely proved by his own word, he is going to perfect the end time church by giving them an assurance and a positive belief in what they do believe. Before perfection consists of the fact that we all come into the knowledge, not only the Son of God, but that also leads to other things. There's got to be a common knowledge among all of us so that we all understand the whole thing. So tonight, brothers and sisters, I want to say, it's actually the first 15, 15 days of that month that points to the month of the Passover. And that first 15 days, brothers and sisters, is what overshadowed 1,500 years. Because this started out, brothers and sisters, in 1491 B.C. And every year in that period of time, they repeated this same cycle. So that overshadowed that, that 1,500 years. It's actually 1,491 years, but you can say 1,500 years. Now, why did God set the type like that? Because when that 15th century came to a close and the Passover month was precisely right on line. The Passover offering was here. It was Christ. And brothers and sisters, the Jewish nation that that was given to by law, by commandments, here they're going through the ritual of it again. And yet they did not realize, brothers and sisters, that at that same time there was a man in their society, their high priest was putting on trial that night, getting ready to condemn him and to crucify him the next morning. And brothers and sisters, the whole incarnation has been blinded by the fact they were the ones that received the law. But it is an utter shame, brothers and sisters, out of that same generation of Jews, there were a small nucleus that got the revelation why John the Baptist came on the scene to introduce something. Then Jesus followed, picking right up. He made more, brought more, more out. And yet the high priest and those that condemned him and they crucified him. And the third day he arose. 
fulfilling every part of that Passover season that was by natural animal sacrifice. This is exactly why, brothers and sisters, many Adventists, they make Paul a liar from what all he says in the New Testament. It seems as though every time we have ever published anything on this, it ain't long, um, long. I will get a letter from some of them characters trying to tell me that this Sunday worship is a pagan holiday. I have to say in return, you would not know a pagan day from any other day. You're so blinded by one little stipulation, law, law, and the Sabbath. But don't forget, that fourth commandment, which was to absorb the Sabbath, was the fourth one in the order. Why would it be necessary to pick out one and hinge eternal life on that one, then mix it with a little grace and say that's what makes up the gospel and condemn all the rest? When we look at all the types, when Christ then did hang on the cross, he has also prayed in the 17th chapter of St. John. Three things he said. Father, I have given to them thy word. Father, I have finished the works. That's the miracle in the ministry he did. And I have revealed unto them thy name. And they hung him on the cross. And in the final hours, brothers and sisters, he cried out, it's finished. The Passover sacrifice has now been offered. And the very same people that has had the type for 1,500 years was the one that was pointing the finger, condemned him to die. I have to say tonight, brothers and sisters, in our religious Gentile world of theology, we have become the same kind of people that's taken the gospel of grace, twisted it, give it any kind of a meaning we want it to mean. They're mixing a little law with a little bit of grace, thinking that's going to be the gospel. All these scriptures pertaining to this, I want to save them for the convention time. But I want us also to realize there has to be a people on this earth in this end time that God has led out of all these systems of religion. Cleanse their minds. Give them an understanding of how to look at the scriptures and to know just exactly what our faith consists of. We have just finished last Sunday, brothers and sisters, a message that we took the scripture out of Revelation, the third chapter and the 14th verse, where Jesus is saying to John, He was the beginning of the creation of God. 90% of Christendom will plainly tell you He was absolutely in the original creation and everything. They take it that far back. I have read all kinds of documents what theologians, historians, have referred Christ to having been. They want to say He was the majesty. He was the Word by which God created all things. It gives you the opinion, brothers and sisters, that Jesus was up there by the Father all the time, and the Father decides to do something, so He says to the Son, the Word, you go do this, you go do that. That's the way the thought is left. But none of them in all the writings tells you exactly, precisely, well, what did he do if he was up there as a being? But then when we come to the New Testament and see what the Apostle Paul wrote, I have to say, brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul put the capstone on it all. When I referred to what, what, referred to what Paul said this morning, in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that Jesus was the first fruits. Where did Paul get that first fruits at? 
He got that from that type there in Leviticus. That wave offering. The damn Jews had been cut in every year for 1,500 years. When they get ready to gather in the harvest, they go out there and cut that little bundle of grain, stalk and all. They tie it together and bring it to the temple. It would lay there for the days to come so that the high priest would have that. To him, it was just a bunch of grain to fulfill a ritual by waving it before the Lord on the next day after the Jewish Sabbath that occurred in the Passover season. Now, ain't it something other for us just to get blinded on something like that? It's all natural. Any preacher could get out here and wave some sheets of paper, too. But remember, that sheaf offering pointed to something. But did they see what it pointed? No. It pointed to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who would fulfill the type of it. So I can say to you tonight, brothers and sisters, the morning that Mary and them came to the tomb to see Jesus, he's already risen. And the angel had said, why seek you the living among the dead? He's risen. They was about ready to turn away, then Jesus spoke to them. Now think of it. Here was the first fruits from the dead. And here was some little disciples the little backwoods, fisher-type people, not educated much, but they had believed in this man and what he taught. When they did see him and he spoke to them, think of it. Here they were seeing the first fruits. While the high priest at the temple, he was busy getting into that pile of grain and waving each one of these just to fulfill the ritual. That looks like re religion all over today repeating itself. Never knowing what the types or anything are. So I'm saying this tonight, brothers and sisters. When I go back 2,000 years ago, and I see from the scriptures of what Paul said in Romans 8, that Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, foreordained to be the firstborn among many brethren, that you and I might obtain adoption. Through that means, by the choice of God, that you and I may be by, made part of that family. This definitely 2,000 years ago was the beginning of something that's went on down through 2,000 years. And oh, how the dirty devil has absolutely chewed on it, hacked away at it to mess it up. But it's right here at the end time when the, the outward picture does look dark and dismal. God because of the sincerity of certain people's hearts. He's going to open our minds. He's going to open our spirits. And he's going to let us see what potentially we have been chosen to become. I want to say this. Just in the natural, a lot of people think, well, we're the first creation. No, you're not. In the natural brothers and sisters, yes, we're a part of the second creation. But in the spiritual sense, you are part of the beginning of the third creation and don't even realize it. How many realize that? The Bible has got enough in it, brothers and sisters, if men would look at it right. It will prove itself. When I said this morning... Like I got this letter from this fellow. He had just plainly stated. He was not so much interested in the six creative days, 24 hours. And a period of time prior to that, 
which might have been, we will say, the prehistoric world. He wasn't interested in that. But as I read that letter, I thought, you poor man. There's more in this Bible in those few verses those prophets of old spoke about than all that that kind of a man could write if he wrote the rest of his life and stacked the stuff up here as tall as tall as your head. A man that talks like that has no vision whatsoever. That's why I said this morning. Here's Isaiah. He lived in the 7th century before Christ. Do you think Isaiah has been going out here crawling around on the ground looking for fossils? I don't think Isaiah was looking at anything like that. What made him open his mouth in that 14th chapter? And he called that devil exactly his angelic name before his fall. Lucifer, son of the morning. That's not taking him back to Art Eden, and you know it. That was taking him way back there in his early beginning, wasn't it? Then somebody tell me why. I have to say, brothers and sisters, to me that's a little beginning of an insight that God's going to let be written and recorded in the chronology of his scriptures down to time. If Isaiah would have been the only one, we might have had reason and excuse to complain about it. But then here comes Jeremiah in the fourth chapter. He says almost precisely, word for word, what's in Genesis 1, 1, 2. Why did God let him see that? What's the purpose behind it? It's to let you and I know, brothers and sisters, God created this planet that you and I live on. And there had been a prehistoric world here. Look at universal Christian, brothers and sisters, when I was a little child growing up. Darwinism was coming on the scene. They was fighting a tooth and toenail. Just to talk about evolution and stuff like that, brothers and sisters, everybody said it's of the devil. Well, I grant you to talk about evolution and things like that in those terms, yes. But when we begin to get our eyes open, the devil did not create this planet. God created this. And that's why we've got to come to a conclusion. On this planet, however many millions and billions of years ago it might have been, God created it, but he created angelic beings. And that era of time, brothers and sisters, God let it go on long enough. Till this planet Earth was gradually, by natural causes, coming in, we will say, to a fruitful state. The planet definitely had to grow into, a, we will say, a fruitful state that life could exist here. You can't plant trees on the edge of a volcano. How many knows what I mean? So we've got to realize, brothers and sisters, it took time for the natural elements of creation to begin to develop the breaking down of different materials and stuff that will eventually become a soil that can become habitable for life, both seed, plant life, animal life, and such. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, God created his angelic family all righteous. Then he put them here, and then somewhere in that era of time, he presents an opportunity. They made a choice. Now we've got to accept the fact that they made a choice. If they did, then God seen the day, brothers and sisters, he had to call the whole thing into judgment. When he did, he seen every angel, brothers and sisters, that had absolutely rebelled against him, 
against his creative laws, had perverted the natures of animals by doing what they did, and that caused God to judge the whole thing. Now, if, the, if Jesus referred to Satan as the father of lies, what does that mean? Did he not then originate the first lie? Well, I have to say, brothers and sisters, since God knew who the ringleader was, it had to be Lucifer. So can't you see God called the angelic beings in confrontation? And I can see him as he looked at old Lucifer. Lucifer, what have you been doing? You hear this in every court case up to day. Nothing. Are you guilty? I'm not guilty. That's that dirty devil repeating his same old tactics and lies to make himself look good. On and on this went as God passed from angel to angel to angel to angel. And sooner or later they've all had to commit their guilt or innocence. And when God has absolutely seen that they're all that have disobeyed him, perverted things, strayed from his rules and laws, that's when God, brothers and sisters, ministered judgment. And I have to say, I ask all of you, what kind of a climate was this planet enduring then? It had a perfect climate. If ferns could grow in the regions of the polar regions, why was it? It's because it had a perfect climate. This planet Earth was not covered two-thirds of water. And the reason I'm bringing this out tonight, brothers and sisters, I'd like to for you, I could, I'd like to get you to think. You are a part of God's third creation. Well, how could that be so, Brother Jackson? When I asked the question this morning, have you been born again? Have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? You know what that puts you in? That puts you in God's new creation. All at the same time, this old creation that we are born in Still with sin. Look at it out there. That's your old creation. And I just seen the news a while ago. I feel so sorry for our soldier boys. Going over there, brothers and sisters, to fight a war, to please a bunch of politicians that don't know a bit more about than a mouse on Mars does. Now, I said that for a figure of speech. Oh, now, the militia have been rising up against some of the Italian troops, been shooting at them. It would not surprise me, brothers and sisters, instead of this thing getting better, it's going to get worse. But just let's, leave, just, let's just leave that there. But when we look at ourselves, a lot of people have had this idea for centuries of time. Well, we're going to go to heaven and we're going to live forever with Jesus. And they cut the whole picture off. If you follow the route of the scriptures right straight into the book of Revelation, that's not the way it's going at all. If Jesus was the first fruits from among the dead, he's the beginning of something. If he's the firstborn among many brethren, then he's the beginning of something, isn't he? That's when he began to do something other that's recorded in the scriptures. Nothing is telling you what was supposed to be done eons of light years before. And I have to say, brother and sister, he didn't exist there as a being. He only existed in the mind of the eternal spirit that waited for the time, brothers and sisters, for him to bring that forth. And that's going to be the beginning of his third creation. Now then, but then God did judge this planet. What did he destroy? 
He destroyed the traces of his first creation. Right or wrong? Why are these skeletons out here today? These fossilized bones. Why did they die all fully decay? God wanted enough of it left to let you and I years later know. There had been another creation here of life. And God was behind it all. But then when God seen fit, that it comes in, we will say, to the human race, this second dispensation, this second creation. That's when he starts renewing the planet. And them creative days, brothers and sisters, he was not creating one molecule, one fiber of anything. He was bringing it out of that chaotic judged state. And when it reads in Genesis 1, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Do you know what that word deep is? It don't mean a hole in the ground. It meant space. Now I've read enough about these things, brothers and sisters, through the years. Taking the National Geographic magazine. Some of their philosophies I have not went with. But the archaeological things that... I have read a proof that something did go on and we would be foolish to not accept it. So I'm saying this, brothers and sisters, them first creative days in Genesis was the dispensations of time, each time, each period, a thousand years. God was slowly bringing this planet Earth out of that chaotic judged state. Now let's, re let's try to imagine, look back, and darkness. If there had been a perfect climate at one time, what caused it now, since judgment has been ministered, that darkness? Some were brothers and sisters, the planet Earth has went through some kind of a catastrophic upheaval that's moved it over out of relationship to the sun because it's in the proper relationship to the sun and all the waters that are in the space because the planet earth at that time was not two-thirds covered with water how many will agree with me it was more exposed soil the biggest part of this excess water was all in space from the vapor barrier. But when the planet Earth itself became rocked out of perfect relationship to the sun, that put it in a category where then the heat, the ultraviolet rays of the sun could no longer now penetrate and keep the atmosphere warm because that's what kept it a perfect climate. So then, brothers and sisters, things began to slowly freeze. And I have to say that ice age lasted for hundreds into thousands of years. So that by the time, brothers and sisters, this planet, the bigger part of it is covered with frozen up ice and stuff. But space, where all of this water is at, it's frost. I have saw pictures, brothers and sisters, that they've taken in the northern regions, around the polar regions, on certain days, you can't see nothing. Because the air is filled with that cold frost. Now just absolutely picture that, brothers and sisters. All them waters that normally would be your filtering for the sun so that the sun could beam the proper radiation to the earth to warm it. When that's all been out of, brought out of kilter, all of this is going to become a frozen substance. And so all around this planet, brothers and sisters, you have nothing but a floating mass of frost. No wonder darkness was upon the face of the deep. But then what does it say? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God did not light a lantern somewhere. 
It's how he began to show his favor toward the subject when he did. Then, brothers and sisters, it tells you the next verse. And the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters. What does that tell you? It's that atmosphere where all this water is a frozen, it's a frost, just rotating around the planet. And he began to separate the waters from the waters. And he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the, the waters. What's he actually saying? He's going to take a lot of these waters right back where they're supposed to be and then confine the others to the earth itself to function. And now then he's clearing up the atmosphere. So I have to say, brothers and sisters, you don't have to go to college to learn something like this. You could just read your Bible and be sensible and reasonable. Now I want to say this. Did you know, brothers and sisters, the last 50 years has brought to the knowledge of man today more about the prehistoric existence than the last 500 years all put together. All over this earth, from nations to nations, they are absolutely digging out of the fossilized bones of a prehistoric creation. They existed. So we can say, that was an era that God tested his angels. And in that, he got his righteous angels, didn't he? But when he come into this second period, where he's going to use the planet again? He's using these angels to help him in this period. That's why he says in the 26th and 27th verse of the first chapter, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So angels was already a spirit being. So then the man that God's going to make is also going to be a spirit being. What's he going to be made for? He's going to be made to have rule and dominion on this planet. Now you see the second period come into existence. But when you go back and look at this, 6,000 years, brothers and sisters, God spoke every bit of this into existence. All the angelic beings that are loyal to Him, they know exactly their position, what their purpose is, what their function will be, once God activates it all. But then when He had a Sabbath, think seriously now, there was not one thing crawling around on this earth yet. Did you know, brothers and sisters, when that Sabbath was over, seven 1,000-year periods has elapsed and went by. Now the planet Earth has warmed. I can see plant life beginning to grow. And God looks down, and it's time to activate His plan. So, brothers and sisters, he creates a garden in a certain geographical spot on earth. Then the next thing he does, there's not, seeing there's not a man to till the earth. The last thing on the sixth creative day he created was man. But here on the eighth day, man's the first thing. He creates man. What did he create this man for? To have sub to subdue the earth, refurbish it, replenish it. That first man and the beginning, brothers and sisters, was made perfect, precisely, with an ordained plan imparted into him by the mind of God. He knew exactly what he was purposed was to do. Had Adam and Eve never failed God in their commission, Let's be sensible. There would have never been a reason for you and I to have a Savior. How many realize that? There would have been no such thing as sin. 
There would have never been wars and killings and diseases. There would have never been a graveyard. But then the second creation is now set in motion. But when was it set in motion? Not on the seventh day. It was set in motion on the beginning of the eighth day. And I look at you tonight, and don't you look at me and say I'm crazy. You are the beginning of the next eighth day. That's exactly, listen to me. That's exactly why Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Did you know the morrow after the Sabbath, it takes you to the eighth day. It's the next day after the Sabbath, but it's starting all over. Now let's look at the Sabbath. Does it tell you and I that the, the Sabbath was the perfect thing? No. It's the end of the cycle. So since Adam was put on the earth at the beginning of, yes, the first day as far as the creation side, but already what God has done, he's on the eighth day. So let's take from then, from Adam to our time, Wars, killings, diseases. Every day you turn the news on. Little children being killed. College girls being kidnapped. Find their bodies out, mutilated and torn to pieces. I see a nation, brothers and sisters, that one time knew God. But they got to the place that weren't pleased with the free speech that we did have. They wanted to kick that all out the back door. And now, brothers and sisters, we've got killings every day. Murders. There is no ethics, no principles, no loyalty. It lets me know, as man lives in the ending of his 6,000 years of labor, struggle, He's trying to find an answer to his solution, but he's missed it. But that's why Jesus, as was picked up in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, he's the beginning of the creation of God. 2,000 years ago when he was born, then he was raised from the dead, then brothers and sisters, he ascended on high, he became a mediator, a high priest, and the Holy Ghost descended, brothers and sisters. And out of each generation of time, there's been an element of people called to be partakers of this same benefit and blessings with Him. And I'm saying this tonight. He is making you and I potentially already a part of the third creation. I'm going to realize that. Now, as we're sitting here tonight, I'm not going to keep you much longer. Why do I say that we're becoming a part of the third creation? Well, the number one, you have something in your heart that the world don't have. What is that? Salvation. You don't go to college to get salvation, do you? Can you go into a bank and buy it? No. It's a gift from heaven, isn't it? You're in this world, but yet you're not of this world. Right? You've been appointed to be the beginning of something other brothers and sisters they can't even see yet. But now as we come to the close of this sixth day of the natural process, we all know that the book of Revelation speaks of a millennium. Well, the word millennium, brothers and sisters, itself means a thousand. So we don't have to speculate how long that kingdom is going to last. It's going to last a thousand years. That's a day. So that's the seventh day of this cycle, isn't it? But did you know, brothers and sisters, we have this promise. That's why I said this morning. We have this promise one of these days when this little church that's at the end time here, God has perfected it cleaned up its mind, got it out of all the traditions. It's got a picture in its heart. They know exactly who they are. 
They know exactly what's getting ready to take place. He's coming to receive us to Himself. No, He's not taking us to live in heaven for eternity. He's just taking us up there, brothers and sisters, so we'll be married to Him as His legal, legal wife. And when I say a wife, I hope you understand me. You're already going to be living in a glorified body. So your mind is no longer being subject to the natural mental things as it is related down here. You're going to be invested with an insight, a knowledge from the grace of God that's going to enable you and me to return with Christ in Revelation 19. And brothers and sisters, God's going to enact judgment, death, to this present world system out here. And out of his mouth goes a sharp edged sword, and he's going to slay the wicked. And their dead bodies are going to lie from one end of the earth to the other. What's God doing? He's raining judgment on this earth. It's already had one judgment. And the critics don't even believe that. But I do. That's why we got all this water here. I say to you tonight, brothers and sisters, before there was such a thing as Noah having to build a boat, every land mass on this planet was communicated to each other. And brothers and sisters, had sin not entered the picture, which enabled and caused God to say, it repents me that I've even made man. I believe, brothers and sisters, by the time 3,000 years of time would have last by, all the rest of the polar regions would have already been thawed, and that water would have been taken back out there. And we would have a perfect climate on this planet. But when that judgment came, that threw everything completely out of balance. So the fact that the critics don't want to accept that there was a flood, they'd have to answer, well, why is it that there's two-thirds of it covered by water? So then I have to say, since I say we are a part of that third creation, because did you ever stop to think God does things in threes? He's got a reason for doing things in threes. When he tested that angelic family back there in that prehistoric world, that lasted a long enough time. God had his reason for watching over them angels. And that's why when we read the Old Testament, we come to an understanding that within that angelic family of God that are righteous, there's three kinds of angelic beings. Some are winged creatures. Others are not. But within all of it, there are definitely three categories of angelic beings. Then when I take a look at ourselves, what's going on? When Jesus comes, brothers and sisters, and takes his bride saints to himself, keep in mind, all those Old Testament saints, he's done tucked them up there. How many realize that? They've already got a glorified body. Now when he comes and takes his bride, that takes out of the crust. And those that are living, those that are really in Christ that make up his bride, he's going to take them up. You have two categories of people right there. But then when we come back, brothers and sisters, do you know what we're going to do? Out of this present realm of humanity out there, there's a small element of those people. They're in their mortal flesh yet. But there's going to be an element of them preserved. No, they're not going to be saved to be Christians and things like that. They're going to be saved, preserved to be the ones that inhabits, that makes up the nations that are saved. It's going to be their job, brothers and sisters, to replenish the planet again. Little babies will be born. Longevity of life will be restored. 
while the immortal ones are in the capacity of rule and such. And don't ask me to go into a category, brothers and sisters. You know good and well, in every kingdom, you always got different levels of authority of human beings. You had it in King Solomon's hour. You've got it also in governments of today. Some of it oughtn't to be there in the first place. They're nothing but just a bunch of crooks. But the point of it is, brothers and sisters, all of those that are immortal, they're going to absolutely live and reign with Christ in certain realms of authority. These others, that's your third level. Now listen carefully to me. And the millennium has started. Now I ask you, who's on the earth then in that millennium? That's the beginning of his third creation. And you, you are going to sit there with him ruling and reigning. Why does it say in Revelations, he has made us unto our God, kings and priests. Is that just a figure of speech? The bride is being taken out of every race, every color, on this planet. And when God comes and Jesus sets up his kingdom on this earth, listen carefully to what I'm saying. Germans will not rule over Dutch. English will not rule over some other dialect. His bride has come out of every nation on the face of this earth as this went around. And she's going to rule and reign with him a thousand years. Doing what? Completing the rest of the third kingdom. Restoring laws. Knowledge. When Paul wrote what he did about Christ in the 15th chapter, Paul sums it up by this. He who is the first fruits, he is made subject to something that's above him. But he that's above him has brought all things under subjection to him. Meaning this, God has placed in his, to his grasp and authority the right to rule and reign on this earth. Doing what? With his righteous redeemed people that helps to make up this third kingdom, he's going to restore to this planet earth now divine laws, authorities, judgments. And since that seventh stage is not the perfect age yet, but it is the process of completing the third stage. Try to get the picture. You will not be creating anything after you go into the eternal kingdom. How many realize that? It's all going to be done in the millennium. And I have to say, when the millennium starts, all that water is going to still be out there. This is why I have to say, brothers and sisters, just going through John 3, 16, John 5, 24, I believe the Bible. No, you don't. You're just like kids playing marbles. We pick out the little things we can play with. But the things, brothers and sisters, that really begin to come together and formulate a picture, well, I don't know. But when the time does come, brothers and sisters, for that to be taken over the scriptures, over the pages, God puts it in the mind of people for it to become a reality. And I say tonight, that living element of God's bride right now is going to be informed, revelated, so that when we come back and Jesus takes over the kingdoms of this world, he's going to live and reign in Jerusalem. One king and one lord of all the earth. But his bride, his bride and his immortal saints are going to sit in places, in positions of authority. And for a thousand years, 
with these other people of the mortal nations. They're going to multiply. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, diseases will not be running rampant. Death will not be hereditary. Death is only, and we will say, a disciplinary means that God uses. To disciplinary, we will discipline that mortal realm of flesh. That's why it's the seventh age. It's the seventh day. It's the seventh dispensation. But it's not the perfect. But in that process, things are being more and more restored to perfect. So that then, brothers and sisters, by the time the thousand years are over, you know what's happened? You've got a redeemed earth, beautified, glorified. Nature will no longer withhold its substance. The plowman shall overtake the reaper. They will farm and, and till the ground. One cycle right after another. The earth shall not withhold its increase. That's when righteousness rules. Not politicians. Not sin. And for a thousand years, each year is going to get better and sweeter, better and sweeter, better and sweeter. Watch these masses of oceans. The water lines along the coasts. They're not going to get bigger. They're going to decrease. What's going on? He's ruling in righteousness. He's in the process of renewing the earth. And it's all going to be a plenty of picture, brothers and sisters, when that thousand years has come to its end. That's the earth's Sabbath. How many understand that? Because the word Sabbath means rest. It means in that time, brothers and sisters, mankind rests from his labor of the burden of sin. That's the way we've got to look at it. So then, brothers and sisters, since there is many, many people born on the earth, God would be an unjust God to let all them masses pass off into the eternal age having never been tested or tried, as people of all other preceding ages. So, brothers and sisters, he has allowed the devil to be turned to a little season, and he'll go out upon the breadth of the earth. And let me say this, that dirty devil will never be allowed to contaminate the earth with one perverted sin. But he will be allowed, brothers and sisters, to sow in the heart of a lot of them people. Them mortal people. He'll deceive them. He'll get them to agree with him. They will make the choice to do so. But they will never be allowed, brothers and sisters, to go so far to carry it out. Because God will not allow rebellion and another war to break out. But when the devil thinks he's got all of these, he'll make it up with them. Come on, let's, let's encircle the capital. That's none other than Jerusalem. Now let's take over this glorified kingdom. God lets them plan that so far until they're in position. And I'll say this, there'll never be the sound of a rocket a machine gun, nor an airplane, nor nothing. Fire proceeds down out of heaven and devours that bunch of rebels. That tells me, brothers and sisters, that leaves the planet at this time void of any effect of what their sin was going to lead them to do. How many see the picture? Oh yeah, the wicked dead are still out there. But now that fire has come down and, and we will say liquidated these, 
Then we see Jesus. He takes the last position. And as I have read the different articles about these writers, brothers and sisters, they put Jesus way up there millions of years ago, or oh, he was the majestic this, and he's the majestic that. He was the, he's an eternal being before the fathers, and yakety yak they go. But they never able to tell you, well, what did he do? But little old Apostle Paul plainly tells us what he did. And he had a beginning, brothers and sisters. And that was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, brothers and sisters, when God opened up his bosom and brought forth the expression of that which had been there all his life, all of his time. He took from his mentality the word that he had planned for redemption and caused him to be born of a virgin birth. Yes, he was born of a woman under the law. So that he could die and redeem them that were under the curse of the law. That's what the Apostle Paul said. It was not the plan of God to leave the human race under the effects of the law for eternity. That means sevens and all. The seventh was a type. And that's why, brothers and sisters, when the Levitical law come along and spoke about that sheep offering, there was another Sabbath right there. But it's actually the eighth day. How many realize that? It's pointing to that new kingdom. And so when brothers and sisters, death and hell give up the dead, all the graveyards, what does that do? That destroys from the face of this planet all traces of what man's sin in ages gone by. Then what does it say? Then shall the kingdom be delivered back up to God, the Father, that God may be all in all. Now I ask you in a simple way. Paul told you exactly what he was ordained to be. To me, he's my elder brother. To me, he is God's only begotten Son, brought forth into existence 2,000 years ago, that he might be a means of paying the way to redeem me out of this curse of sin that's been going on for 6,000 years, to give me the potential of a hope of eternal life, eternal existence, in an age where there is no end. So when the earth's Sabbath is over, that's the millennium. You know what the next picture you see? John said, I saw a new heaven. Don't, skip, don't, get, don't get scared of it. It's going to be just as real as, as you're sitting here now. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, brothers and sisters, you know what that lets me know? Jesus Christ was the beginning of that. And he's the ending of that. The end don't mean it no longer exists, but the end of the purpose for which God had in it to put it into that position. That's why he is the beginning and the end of the new creation of God. And it doesn't tell you from there on anything. Other than Christ is your elder brother, but he will always be before, be before the throne of God so that God might be all in all. God's got his children, man, in three stages. If he's got his angels in three stages, he's got his human beings in three stages. And that's the third kingdom. That's the eternal kingdom. That's the eighth day in which there will be no end. World without end, and brothers and sisters, each eternity begin. And I have to say, it's a wonderful thing to look forward. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight, there's many things can be said. I pray that God, as the week comes on, 
and the time of fellowship will begin. Help me, Father, to be able to relate to the people how the Apostle Paul wrote the, law, the gospel. And many of these Advent characters, they make Paul a liar. But help me, Lord, to be able to present it in its simplicity and its truthful way that we can all see, Lord, once and for all, there's a perfect picture for us to have and grasp in our hearts as we get ready to be bound together and to meet the coming of our Lord. Bless these nights coming up, Lord. And may our hearts be prepared for this, this, this occasion. I pray now, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we're going to get ready and take the Lord's Supper, so I'm going to ask Brother Bud to come on over and he'll take it over from here.